Corinth was a city full of elitist viewpoints, and Christ followers were unsure how to handle the cultural, spiritual, and intellectual elitism that was so prevalent in this city. Many of the Christians attempted to hold on to one of the cultural elitist views while also embracing Christianity, and Paul's going to challenge that. So in this section, Paul uses numerous technical terms that the Corinthians themselves used to justify their elitism and to intimidate others. He's going to use words like wisdom, mature, secret, and spiritual. Some Corinthians believed there was a secret knowledge that only they had, Gnosticism. Others believed that they were wiser than other people based on logic and philosophy. Paul's going to challenge that. What we also will see in this section of Paul's letter to Corinth is that these verses have endured much misapplication in the history of the church. Let's read it, attempting to see what Paul was saying to them and how it applies to us. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Corinth was a city filled with dividing lines. It was this incredible place in the ancient world where culture, politics, religion, philosophy, education, humanity collided. It was a city that had great privilege, great wealth, great opportunity, but it was also a city of great brokenness, great separation, great poverty. You know, when I think about it, I'm not sure that it was that much different than many of the cities that we're familiar with today. If you think of London, of Paris, of Tokyo, of Hong Kong, of Dubai, of LA, these are cities filled with dividing lines. And they're filled with dividing lines because they're filled with people. And where there are people, there will always, always be division. So we continue to live in a world very similar to Corinth, a world filled with divisions. And the world that we live in now, we, we can really divide over some of the craziest things, some of the simplest things, some of these things that are truly at the surface. And even though we might like to talk about them, they might be important to us, they probably don't matter that much. Think about it this way. We will divide even over things like our pets, right? So you look at this picture, and right away, you're kind of drawn to one of these, right? So there's people, I know this, in, the, in a room this big right now, for some unknown reason that makes very little sense to the rest of us who are Americans, you are drawn to the cat, right? You would even say, I am a cat. A 
a cat lover. Someone said that publicly. They said, I am, my identity is, I am a cat lover. And then the rest of us very logically have thought through this and said, that is a picture of a dog. Dogs we understand, dogs we love, they love us. Cats don't love us, right? So it just makes sense. So we divide over these things. We also divide over, well, things like the color of a dress, right? You almost melted the internet a couple weeks ago. There were 670,000 of you on BuzzFeed talking about this at the same time. Is it white? Is it gold? Is it blue? Is it black? I'll tell you the color. The color is who cares, right? (laughs) We divide over sports. We can all agree there's one team on the screen. The other team, well, we can't even really call them a team, can we? But then there's these other dividing points, these dividing lines that that start to maybe elevate our blood pressure, elevate our temperature. They start to matter to us a little bit more. If we dig slightly deeper, these lines are still there. And these are lines maybe in the area of politics. We've got to get some new mascots. Um, We we divide ourselves saying we're, we're red states. We're blue states. We divide over economics, the 99%, the 1%, those who have, those who don't. We divide over education, accomplishment, and employment. And all of a sudden, I think we start to feel that, yeah, there's some of these lines that are a little more important to us. But if we continue to dig even deeper, there are lines that seem to stay with us, to maybe not be able to be forgotten. These are lines of perhaps shame, lines of history, lines that affect how we look at ethnicities, lines that affect how we look at race and how people in our culture and cultures around the world have been treated. There's lines that divide us over life. When does it end? When does it begin? When is it my choice? And ultimately, probably one of the greatest, one of the deepest cutting dividing lines is the line of God himself. What does he want from us? What is he doing? Where is he leading us? And see, these dividing lines begin to shape the very identity of who we are. Because dividing lines lead to separation, and separation leads to identity. And our identity leads us to be the people that we are right here, right now. And I think this is exactly what Paul, 2,000 years ago, was saying to the church. There are these deep, deep dividing lines. And he, he is leading the church to a point where they will see this, and they will see that there is actually only one dividing line that cuts through everything else, and there's only one dividing line that truly matters. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, as we look at the text this morning, I'm going to be real honest with you up front. This is kind of a tough one. It's kind of a difficult text. And, uh, you know, I doubt that you're just going to read through it real quickly and close the Bible and say, yeah, I totally got this. I know exactly what's going on here. I understand what God's saying. I can completely apply this to my life. Let's wrap this up. I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, I have three goals this morning. You're going to see a little checkbox on your program this morning. And my goal is that when you leave here this morning, you're gonna be in one of three categories. You're gonna leave here this morning and you're gonna be maybe encouraged. And that would be great. And you're gonna leave, maybe you'll leave here this morning and you'll be challenged, and I would love that. But maybe you'll leave here this morning confused. And I'm okay with that. I know I'm setting the bar pretty low for myself. (laughs) But I think this is a tough text. And when we start to look at it and try to apply it to our lives, it can be difficult. So if you leave encouraged, if you leave challenged, if you even leave confused, I'm going to be okay with that this morning. But before we jump in, I think it's good that we need to, we can need to kind of set the stage of how did we get to this point in the text? How do we get to verse six? We've got to look at the first five verses. Paul does something really incredible here in his letter to Corinth. He doesn't begin with kind of the brilliant and the eloquent. Instead, he starts right out of the gate with the dark and the gloomy. He starts saying, listen, I'm going to know one thing. 
I'm going to know one thing, and that one thing I'm going to know is Christ crucified. So in the face of everything, you know, Paul was a guy that could go toe-to-toe with anyone, with the best philosophers, with the most educated. He could get right in their face and have a great argument with them, but he said, I'm not going to do that. Do that In this culture that values wisdom, that, that values philosophy, that values education, I'm going to choose to know one thing, and that one thing is this. I'm going to choose to know Christ crucified. And he takes this amazing tactic here. It's like every single argument that you could bring to him, he only knows one thing. He says, but Paul, what about religion? Christ crucified. Paul, what about education? Christ crucified. What about my feelings? Christ crucified. What about my emotions? Christ crucified. But Paul, what about our philosophy and our culture? Christ crucified. See, Paul knew that there was a deep, deep dividing line. And he knew that Christ crucified was that line. And he knew that that line cut through everything else. And culture faded away. And philosophy faded away. And education faded away. It was about what people would do with that dividing line. Because he knew that that dividing line would impact our lives for eternity. And that's what he was trying to point out to the Corinthian church. And I think that's what he was trying to point out to us. So let's go ahead and grab your Bible if you have it. And let's jump into the text in verse 6. He says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, these are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul is a masterful writer, a masterful writer. And he does this thing where he builds anticipation. He builds builds almost this, this pregnant purpose within the text, letting them know that I have a secret. I have what I would call a sacred secret that I want to tell you in the text. And in these first few verses, he kind of builds this resonance of this secret And he calls it four specific things. He said, this is a secret that I would describe you as something having a hidden wisdom. A hidden wisdom. If you remember David's message from last week, he said that the Jews were looking for a savior, for a Messiah that would come with great power and liberate them. And those outside the Jewish faith were, were looking for a savior, for a Messiah, for someone that would provide this existential, this great wisdom to lead them beyond themselves. But they were looking for things that they missed. They missed when they came face to face with Jesus. In Acts chapter 13, it says this, the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. They did not recognize someone who didn't come with this preconceived idea of power, this preconceived idea of wisdom. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the very words of the prophet that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate, to have him executed. Part of this sacred secret is that it was a hidden wisdom. The second way Paul describes it, he said, this is a secret that is for our glory. For our glory. There's a a Spanish mystic, and and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you read him, but his name is Miguel Unamano, and he, he has this book called The Tragic Sense of Life, and he ends the book with this line saying, I do not pray that God would grant you peace. I pray that God would grant you glory. I pray that God would grant you glory. See, I think sometimes in this life, we become so misguided that we think it's here and now that what is what really matters. And we can get so off track chasing after the small things of this life when God is saying, I have something so much greater, with so much greater intention, with so much greater opportunity that is for your glory. And Paul is saying that to the church there, saying, listen, this secret, it has been a hidden wisdom and it's for your glory. And not only is it for your glory, but it is eternal. It's not just for here and now, but it is an eternal truth. 
And he fleshes this out in Ephesians chapter one. He says, this eternal truth, it says, for he, Christ, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Don't miss this. Look at this. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world. Whereas the text in Corinthians says, before time began. Before time began, God intentionally knew you, had an idea for you, had a plan for you. How much greater is that than the ideas that we have for ourselves, than the plans that we come up with for ourselves? This hidden wisdom this, that's for our glory, it, it's not just an eternal truth, but it actually is beyond even our imagination. Paul does a callback to Isaiah, and he says, this is something, the secret that God has for us, this sacred secret. No, no eye has seen this. No ear has heard it. No mind can even imagine or comprehend this. Comprehend the things that God has for us. This is how Paul is building the text as he begins to lay this out to the church at Corinth, as he begins to lay it out for us here right now. There is something greater, and it is inside this sacred secret. Ray Steadman in his book, Letters to a Troubled Church, says this, the deep things of God are all about how to find meaning in life, how to live an effective and a satisfying life, how to be set free from guilt, set free from shame, how to overcome bitterness and resentment, how to find love, find acceptance, find belonging, find forgiveness. Isn't this what we desire? And Paul is saying, I know the secret. It is a sacred secret. If you're familiar at all with uh, Plato's Republic, he describes a conversation of, of Socrates. And Socrates had this very interesting perspective on reality. He didn't believe that we could truly in this life experience ultimate reality. He had this concept, this, this picture, if you will, that all men were chained to a wall with our backs to the opening of a cave. And all we could see is that light came in the opening of the cave because we could never turn around, we could never see that, that ultimately rea ultimate reality, that the entirety of our lives were just this glimpse of what was really happening, what really mattered, but we were in bondage to these chains. Paul echoes some of those same ideas, some of those same philosophies saying that this has been hidden. But see, what Paul knew was that the chains could be unleashed. What Paul knew was that we could face the light. What Paul knew was that because of Christ crucified, there was a dividing line that separated us to God. What Paul knew was a truth. And see, truth is the greatest of all dividing lines. Truth is the greatest of all dividing lines. See, truth is difficult because it refuses to change. Truth is painful because it cuts through the facades of who we are. It's powerful because it forces us to recognize the need for change in our lives and for change in this world. Truth hurts us because it shows us the brokenness of our own souls. And truth is the eternal dividing line that separates us from God, but it doesn't stop there. See, truth, it also heals those same broken hearts. Truth offers hope to those with no hope. Truth mends lives. Truth puts us back together. Truth brings us to who we really were meant to be in the first place. Truth sets us free from those chains that we may face the light and face our creator as he truly is. That is truth, but that truth is the greatest of all dividing lines. So this is the stage that Paul has set in his letter. So he says, there is this great secret. And I can just imagine them reading this kind of on the edge of their seat. Okay, Paul, what is it? What is it? You've said it's hidden. You've said it's for our glory. You've said it's eternal. It's beyond our imagination. What is it? How do we know it? Let's take a look at chapter, or verse 10. 
In verse 10, he says, these are the things that God has revealed to us by his spirit. See, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Paul's saying, I'm ready for the mystery to be revealed. It is revealed, it is unveiled by the Spirit, by the Spirit of God himself. That is how we know this truth that is the greatest dividing line. It is through God's very spirit. Jesus Christ said when he was with his disciples, I must go, I must leave you, but the one who comes after me, God's spirit, that's who you need. That's who you want. That's who will never leave you. That's who will allow you to know God for who he is. Paul said, this mystery is being revealed, it is unveiled by the Spirit, and it's allowing us to have an understanding of the very mind of God. Who knows you? No, who really, really knows you? You do. Who knows God? Who knows God? God knows God. And Paul is saying, God is giving you his spirit so that as much as possible in the comprehension of our human mind, we may know him too. What an incredible opportunity we have that we would have an understanding as small and as faded as it might be in this life to understand the very mind of God, but that can only be done through his spirit. And Paul describes this as something that is is given freely. There is nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can accomplish. There's nothing that we can bring to this transaction to make this happen. This is something that by God's grace alone happens. He unveils this mystery through his spirit. He provides us an understanding of who he is and he does all of this for free. All of this is given freely. And when he does that, he puts within us what I would say is a new language. The words that we speak, the thoughts that we have, the way that we act, the relationships that we live inside of begin to change. And all of this is because of the Spirit of God within us. But then Paul does something I really don't like. I don't like these next few verses. He takes this harsh turn. He's, he's described this incredible sacred secret, and he's saying, and now I'm going to reveal this mystery to you. But again, he points back to the fact that truth is the greatest of all dividing lines. And when you have division, it means this, that there are going to be those on one side of the line, and there will be those on the other. Let's take a look at how he describes this in verse 14. It says, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject merely to human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul does something here that's very difficult. He divides And he divides over truth, and that truth is Christ crucified. And in Christ crucified, we have opportunity to experience God's Spirit. But he said, there are those who are with the Spirit, and there are those who are without. See, when when we have God's Spirit, when we are with the Spirit, we are a people who can accept the things of God. Not ignorantly accepting all things at face value, but as much as we can comprehend, looking at Scripture listening to God's word, saying, even though, even though those might not be the, the way I would do things, I'm going to put my faith, hope, and trust in one who is beyond me, who is greater than me, and I'm going to accept the things of God. People who, who have God's spirit are people that embrace truth, embrace hard truth, 
are willing to live lives that are changed because of that truth. And people with the Spirit are people who have discernment. Have discernment. People who can look at this world, look at their lives in light of Scripture, and in the reflection of that, make a determination on what is right, what is wrong, what God does want, what God does not want. See, the wisdom of this world does not offer that. And Paul says that with the Spirit, you will be a people that accept the things of God. You will be a people that embrace truth. You will be a people who have discernment. But there are those on the other side who are divided without the Spirit. And these are people that without the Spirit, they reject the things of God. And of course they would. Why would God's plan mean anything to them? Why would God's word have any impact on their life? Without the spirit, without the understanding of who God is and and the plans he has for them, why wouldn't they reject that? They are also a people that would consider truth to be foolish. To consider truth to be foolish. And in considering truth to be foolish, perhaps consider you to be foolish. And don't you sometimes look foolish? Let me get this straight. Your God chose to become a man? Your Savior decided to be a servant? Your Creator was a carpenter's apprentice? It's ludicrous. It makes no sense without the Spirit. And finally, those without the Spirit are people that defy judgment. They bristle at even the very thought of being judged. They push back against anyone saying, no, I I think you might be going over the line there. So then where does this leave us? Where does this leave us? Let's go back to the beginning and then look again at the end. Paul does something very interesting. He says, I'm going to know one thing. And that one thing I'm going to know is Christ crucified. And then the very last phrase of the text, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. Those who are with the Spirit have the mind of Christ. And if we are a people who have the mind of Christ, how different, how revolutionary should our lives look? And I think there's, there's three ways. If we are a people who have this mind of Christ, We're going to look different three ways. We are going to be a people that pray for hope. A people that pray for hope. In 2 Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says this in 2 Timothy 2.25. He says, opponents, I want you to read this, opponents, as people without the Spirit. These people that Timothy were in conflict with. Opponents must be gently instructed. Not judged, not condemned, not looked down upon, but gently instructed for this. In the hope of that God would grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of truth, a hope that God would lead them to repentance. If we are to have the mind of Christ, we must be a people who pray for that hope in the lives of others around us. Secondly, if we are to live out this mind of Christ, we must be a people that love like a fool. Love like a fool. This can sometimes be a tough thing. This can sometimes even be, for our sensibilities, kind of an ugly thing. Let me show you what I mean. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, buckle up here, value others above yourselves. That sounds terrible, right? Just be honest. Value others above yourselves. And he doesn't leave it there. Not looking to your own interests, it gets worse, but each of you to the interests of others. So that the people in my life, the relationships I'm in, if I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I must value them greater than myself. Their interests must supersede any interests that I have. And in my relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. This mind is Christ, of Christ Jesus. What was his mind? It was this. In in the next verse, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the form of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Loving like a fool is not only difficult, it can be ugly. It puts us outside of any comfort zone that we have, valuing others more than ourselves, investing in their interests beyond ours. Where do we get that? We get that from having the mind of Christ. And finally, to take on the mind of Christ, we must be a people that are willing to tell your story to tell your story. Because if you are a follower of Christ, your life must be a picture of the gospel. David Platt calls the gospel this. He defines it this way in his book, Counterculture. The good news that the just and gracious creator of the universe has looked upon hopelessly sinful men and women and has sent his son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to bear his wrath against sin on the cross and show his power over sin and the resurrection so that everyone who turns from their sin and themselves and trusts in Jesus as their Savior and Lord will be reconciled to God. God forever. That is an amazing definition of the gospel. You're probably not going to remember all of it. Let's look at another one. Kind of condensing that down. The gospel is good news. It is a message to be proclaimed. It is a truth to be taught. It is a word to be spoken. And it is a story. It is your story. It is my story as a follower of Christ to be told. If I am going to have the mind of Christ, may my life be marked As a person who prays for hope, a person who prays for hope that they would know truth, a person who loves like a fool so that they would see it, and a person who would tell my story that those around me would hear truth. You may be looking at this and say, this kind of seems familiar. If you've been here for very long, you know that our outreach strategy is simply this, pray, invest, invite. Pray for hope, love like a fool, tell your story. That's what Paul was encouraging the church to do, saying, church, you have been divided. Christ crucified is a dividing line. That truth is the greatest of all dividing lines. But it's time, church, to cross that line. It's time for us to pray, to love to tell. I love stories. I especially love stories that kind of give us a glimpse of redemption, of great hardship, but then being able to overcome that. I'm I'm reading right now Andrew Peterson's Wing Feather Saga, and that book does a brilliant job of painting this beautiful picture it's a, it's a book of two brothers is really the overarching theme. And these two brothers are the rightful heir to a kingdom. Their father has been killed. And in this kingdom, everything is being taken away from them. And there is this deep re- darkness that has become to take over the land. And person by person, town after town, land by land, they're being permeated with this evil darkness. And people are succumbing to this. And these two brothers, Janner, the oldest brother, and Kalmar, the younger brother, they are on this incredible adventure trying to fight back against this darkness. And and in in the course of this adventure, they become separated from one another in battle. And Kalmar, the younger brother, is actually captured. And in his captivity, day after day, he is tempted by this darkness. And Janner, day after day, the older brother is desperately trying to get back to him, to set him free. But Kalmar, that younger brother, after the temptation, continues. And at the call of the darkness, he finally crumbles and gives in to that. And in that moment, he becomes a shattered image of who he was created to be. Half man, half animal with wild, yellow, empty eyes. The author goes in, on to write the story and weaves those stories back together. And finally, the brothers, and the older brother Janner and the remnants of his family and, and Kalmar, they, they come face to face with each other on the deck of a ship. 
And when Kalmar, in all of his shame, in all of his self-loathing and self-betrayal, sees his family and sees his brother, he hurls himself over the side of the ship into the dark, icy waters of the ocean. But no sooner does he splash into the ocean, is, there is a second splash. And it is older brother Janner plunges in after him. And they sink deeper and deeper. And finally, Janner reaches him and grabs Kalmar by the back of his furry neck and pulls him to himself and surges upwards to the surface. And as he does this, he begins to feel the claws of his brother scrape across his back. He feels his fangs sink deeply into his neck and his shoulder over and over and over again. And as they reach the surface, he becomes unconscious. And when he awakes... He is in the berth of the ship. He, Janner, bound to his bunk by his injuries. His wild brother, bound to the bunk next to him by heavy leather cords, howling and snarling at anyone who comes into their room. Day after day, as the sun rises on the horizon, the mother of these two boys comes in and says, good morning, checks on her older son to see how he's healing, and turns to her younger son and says, Kalmar, tell me your name. And he barks and he snaps and he growls and he hisses at her. And as the strength begins to return to Janner, he begins to, begins to tell stories to his brother all night. He tells him stories of these sacred truths, stories of grace, of hope, of forgiveness, of redemption. And night after night, he hears his younger brother growl himself to sleep. Until one night he notices something's different. Kalmar is quieter. And he begins to relay to his younger brother the story of how when they became separated, when his brother was in captivity, all that he had done, how desperate he had been to reach him. And there was no sound. And the next morning when their mother arrived, she checked as she always did on Janner who is doing much better. And she turns to her youngest son and says, son, what is your name? And after a moment of silence, they hear, my name is Kalmar. I am the rightful heir to the throne. And Janner stumbles out of his bunk and grabs a hold of his brother. His eyes open. They're no longer the yellow animal eyes of emptiness, but they are a piercing Blue of truth. I am Kalmar. You are Kalmar. And as we plunge headlong into our sin and our shame and our self betrayal, we had a Savior who plunged in after us, who crossed the greatest dividing line through his own death and reached out to rescue us so that we would be a people who no longer were divided from him with yellow eyes of emptiness, but that we would be a church of people with the piercing blue eyes of truth. Not because we're better than anyone, but because we have a Savior who is better and greater than all. Church, this text has been abused and misused and applied in a way that it has driven throughout history churches and Christians and believers to be people of arrogance, seeing themselves as better than the rest of the world, the rest, better than those on the other side of the dividing line. But I believe this text demands us to fall to our knees in awe of a Savior who was Christ crucified of a savior who crossed that dividing line. And our opportunity is to live lives that pray for hope, that love like fools, and lives that tell a story so much greater than our own. Let's pray. God in heaven, your word leads us to you. Your spirit helps us understand you. In our greatest division, you crossed the line through your son, Jesus, and brought us to yourself. Let us continually be in awe of that. And Lord, let us be a people that point others to you. 
We love you, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I, I told you uh, when I started this morning that I had three goals. Uh, and I hope, you, I hope you got a chance to check one of those boxes off. We're going to be talking about that in group this week. And I really hope that there's a lot of you here that check the box. Man, I was encouraged. Because that's, I'm kind of leaning into that lifestyle already. I'm, I am praying for the hope of those around me. I, I'm loving, even when it's hard, even when it's ugly, even when it makes me look like a fool, I'm willing to do that as much as possible. And by God's grace, when opportunities come my way to tell my story, I'm doing that. And we celebrate that. Every time we see a video of life change here at Northridge, we celebrate the fact that we are a church of people who live that kind of life. But maybe you didn't check encouraged. Maybe like me, you had to check challenged. Because you know that you have an opportunity to impact the lives of those around you and Maybe you're just not very consistent in praying for hope. Maybe you really struggle. You find it difficult to value others greater than yourselves and love like a fool. Maybe like me, you find it tough sometimes to tell your story. How about we change that? How about we change that? Would you join me we have something to talk about that is greater than ourselves. Let us pray for hope. Let us love like fools. Let us tell our story. And lastly, if you, if you checked confused, that's okay. That's okay. Maybe today is the first time that you came face to face with the realization that there is a great dividing line. And you're just not sure which side of that line you're on. Maybe that frustrates you. Maybe that confuses you. Maybe that makes you angry. No problem. I'd love to talk to you more about that. I'll be down front with one of our other pastors, and we would love a chance to talk to you about that. Church, this week, let's cross the dividing line. Let's live lives that pray for hope, that love like fools, and that tell his story. We love you. Have a great week.